Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, Edinburgh and South East Scotland area, our fourth event of the 2020-2021 session. Uh, this one is called, It's Not a Very Certain Future. Uh, our speaker this evening is Gareth Thomas. Uh, Gareth received his doctorate from the University of Birmingham in 2016 with his thesis, Constructing the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Community. Gareth is currently a member of Cardiff University's School of Psychology Understanding Risk Group, and what he's working on the EPSRC funded project, CO2 injection and storage, short and long-term behavior at the different spatial scales. It's not a very certain future. Dr. Gareth Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, everyone. Please bear with me for a second while I share my screen. I'm beginning to get familiar with this interface, but um, I do it infrequently enough that it's always slightly less seamless than I'd like it to be. Can, you, can everyone see that? Yes, you can see yes. that. Excellent, happy days. Um, so thank you for that introduction, Paul. Um, so the work I'm gonna be presenting today um, is some social science research uh, we have been conducting in the Understanding Risk Group attached to the Flexis project, which is a big uh, European uh, regional development fund funded project. So to start with, what, what what the Understanding Risk Group is all about, really, we're an interdisciplinary research group, uh, mainly made up of environmental scientists, geographers, philosophers, uh, psychologists, and social scientists. And my background is in kind of fairly straightforward social science. Uh, the founders of the group all had backgrounds in kind of accident and industrial risk research and looking at issues of risk perception around heavy industry. But over time, that has translated into a focus on environmental risk and kind of public perceptions of energy issues and the kind of risks that uh, technological change might bring to everyday life. Um, so what we tend to specialize in is something called interpretive risk research. The starting premise of which really is the technological controversies, um, public concerns about technological risk um, or scientific risk are seldom rooted in ignorance or nimbyism. And that, that that kind of hypothesis, if you like, is has been fairly convincingly demonstrated to be false. Um, and the way people tend to think about risk in everyday life is more shaped by things like emotions linked to important cultural values, our sense of identity, and the relationships between systems, places, and governance. And that's how it shaped and the way technology interacts with those things um, shapes the way we perceive it as being threatening or positive. Um, I'm going to be talking today quite a bit about deindustrialization. Um, and the reason I'm doing that partly is because the work we've been doing in uh, that I'm going to be speaking about is located in Port Talbot, South Wales, which is still a very industrialized town. This isn't Detroit that we're talking about here. There's still a lot of heavy industry in Port Talbot. But at the same time, that industry has been seen as under threat over the past. It, they've been shedding jobs at a fairly steady rate at Port Talbot Steelworks over the last 30 years. Um, and there's quite a strong literature out there already on the industrialization, the sense of these either former industrial or declining industrial towns and regions as being somehow left behind, as leaving a sense of loss, neglect, trail. Um, which is particularly of the moment today when we start looking at things like uh, populist movements for Trump or Brexit, things like that. Um, the reason that I'm also going to be talking about um, kind of the industrialization and the industrial is because these regions are increasingly becoming objects of policy discourse, particularly as it relates to decarbonization policy, which is now starting to look at some of those harder to decarbonize industrial sectors. Um, and what we're seeing is the emergence of a kind of a new clean growth discourse. Uh, this idea that perhaps we can solve some of the problems of these regions with a kind of a new found low carbon industrial policy, if you like. Um, and what I would suggest is that that isn't really necessarily or what the data that I'm going to be talking to today 
suggests, I think, is that that doesn't necessarily deal with some of these difficult social and cultural legacies left by the last 30 years of a declining industry in, in some of these places. So why study public perceptions at all? Why, why bother? Um, and my response to that would generally be that uh, technology and infrastructure don't exist in isolation, but part of complex socio-technical systems. So they are subject to formal governance, the subsidies through which infrastructure is often funded to begin with, um, public regulation, statutory regulation, um, large scale, kind of the economic relationships through which we interact with the system as either taxpayers or as customers. And then there's also the kind of everyday user practices and daily, inter daily interactions that citizens have with, with large technical systems. So things like turning on, on and off a light switch, comparing energy suppliers, noticing on the landscape as we drive by a, a wind farm or a nuclear power plant, and the decision whether or not we're just gonna drive by it, allow it to blend into the background, or whether we're gonna stop and pick it or throw stones in the place. So lay publics are affected by, by all of these different relationships with heavy industry and technology, or with, it, with infrastructure and technology. And I would argue that in a democratic society, citizens should have a say in how these things are managed and be consulted on a regular basis, preferably before big disruptive decisions are made. Even if you don't buy that argument, I think the quote that I've got at the bottom of the screen down here from Apton Fischoff is really quite apt, where they're saying without public acceptance, it may be impossible for electricity sector, they talk about the electricity sector here, innovations to, to gain regulatory approval, to find sites if you're funding on terms allowing economic viability and suggesting that too often really that the public face of new technologies has been an afterthought and I would I would echo that kind of that sentiment. So the project I'm going to be speaking about today is called the Flexus project. It involves three universities all located in South Wales and it's funded uh, to the tune of 24 and a half million pounds uh, through the EU's regional development fund, and that's running until the middle of this year, although there may well be some form of extension or afterlife to that project. Um, it's got quite significant buy-in from the Welsh government, lots of local authorities in the region, um, and also private business, most notable amongst which is, is Tata Steel, who have a, a large plant in, in Newport Talbot, which is the, the main demonstrator area. And the focus of the project is on place-based decarbonisation. So the argument that as energy networks uh, decarbonise, they're likely to become more decentralised because different areas will have to contend with different availability of local renewable uh, resources, um, different different qualities and standards of network infrastructure, and different demand profiles and, and industrial emitters as well in, in places like Port Talbot. So the project is huge. There are 19 different work packages all focused on different technologies, but the main ones that I'm going to be speaking about today are carbon capture, utilisation and storage, uh, district heating using waste heat from, from the steelworks, uh, hydrogen, uh, both, both green hydrogen and uh, blue hydrogen, so the hydrogen produced using CCS from natural gas, but also things like smart electricity networks and peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. Now, the aim of the work that I'm going to be speaking about today has been to gather social intelligence to feed back into the development of the Port Talbot demonstrator site and to allow local citizens to encounter, deliberate, think about potential futures for local decarbonisation in, in the town. And to do this, there have, we've conducted three streams of work. So expert interviews. So these are interviews with um, predominantly engineers and civil servants. Uh, located in the region that are very much involved in this project as to what their kind of big vision for future decarbonisation in Port Talbot and what that might look like, how that might work. Um, alongside that we've done interviews with members of the community to get a sense of what their relationship is to the town, um, to the place and to the infrastructure around them at the moment and how that might change. Um, and then our third set of data collection has been community workshops which were day-long focus groups basically with six to eight members of the local community um, and a series of social scientists where we were introducing different scenarios of technological change 
and really getting giving people a whole day to learn about this stuff, discuss and think through how it might impact daily life in the town and how, how they felt about some of these changes. So this is a qualitative study. Um, what we're really interested in how, is how people experience and evaluate um, place and infrastructure change. So I have no numbers for you today. I have some pretty photographs. I have uh, lots of kind of detailed quotes. And what that kind of detailed focus with relatively small numbers of people really allows you to do is really get under the skin of, of how people feel about this stuff and how they start to form judgments about what is an unfamiliar and an and uncertain set of issues um, and to really explore how they go about thinking that through and deciding what what a desirable future might look like. So to give a bit of background on Port Talbot, it has a resident a population of approximately 140,000 people. Um, employment rates in the town are marginally below the Welsh average, but average wages are marginally higher. And this is this is a product of um, this site down here in the bottom left hand quadrant of the map. That is the space that is taken up by Tata Steel, the Tata Steel site. And while that's been shedding employees for a, a good number of years, it's still paying very well. And that kind of explains these slightly strange statistics around wages and employment. Um, so it's a, it's a deindustrializing de town, but it is still very much industrial. Um, Tata Steel itself is responsible for approximately 6% of Welsh CO2 emissions um, and has also been linked with some of the air quality issues in the town. Uh, Port Talbot was named several years ago in a World Health, World Health Organization report as one of the most polluted towns in Europe. And it turned out that there was a problem with the data, um, that that label was not in fact accurate. But the image has kind of stuck with the town. There's this kind of stigma attached to Port Talbot of it being a, a polluted place or a dirty place, which local residents were very much aware of and quite uncomfortable about. At the same time, behind this kind of industrial landscape, um, there's quite a lot of quite beautiful countryside surrounding Port Talbot. So it backs on to um, a range of, in, in most parts of the world, they'd be called hills. In, in, in the UK, we call them mountains. Um, it also has a really attractive sandy beach and a historic kind of country estate just on the outskirts of the town. So there's some some quite beautiful countryside and uh, and kind of bits of historic architecture about the place. So in terms of our participant recruitment uh, for our interviews and workshops, we're working with five groups of between six and eight people selected with the assistance of a local recruiter. And what we were recruiting for amongst these groups was a diversity of experiences and, and relationships to place. So these five groups that you see on the right hand side reflect what we saw as potentially different ways of thinking about and relating to Port Talbot. So we had multi-generational residents. These were people who are parts of families who stretch back, whose lives stretch back in Port Talbot across three to four generations. Um, so kind of Port Talbot born and bred, if you like. Uh, we had a group of steel workers. These were people who were not necessarily involved in heavy industrial manufacturing, but all worked within the Tata steel site. So these were Tata employees or both office workers and, and kind of factory workers, if you like. But also things like cleaners, contractors for third party com companies, one or two people who had retired. Uh, we had okay. river users. These were, sorry, was there a question there? I thought I had something coming across my microphone, but that's fine. I'll continue, but interrupt me if, if you want me to stop. Um, we had a group of river users. These were people who used the river either for angling, jogging, um, kayaking, things like that. So had a particular relationship to the kind of the outdoor environment in Port Talbot uh, for kind of leisure purposes. We had young workers. These were people aged between 18 and 29 who we thought would be the, the group that would be most likely to experiencing in, experience kind of system scale decarbonization over a kind of 30, 40 year time period and whose careers may well in, interact with that kind of process of change. And finally, we had a group of green fingered residents who we recruited this. These were people involved in growing food, so horticulture, um, either allotment holders, private gardeners would 
community gardeners with an interest in growing food. And the reason we recruited that group was partly, again, this kind of experience of the outdoor environment, but also a kind of a fairly deep connection to, to nature and the natural world as kind of another way of potentially relating to everyday life in the town. So this is a non-representative sample. We are not claiming that this group is representative um, on a kind of demographic basis to the population of Port Talbot, although we did aim for an even gender split. We did get a good coverage of kind of residency across the town, and we did get a diverse spread of kind of ages and socioeconomic classifications. So it's kind of quasi-representative, but not really. What we're really interested in is these kind of different ways of, of relating to life in the town. And the approach we took was to start with, we, we conducted interviews, each lasting up to an hour and a half, uh, where we asked people to bring along photographs of, of the town. Um, and all of the photographs that I'll be showing from this point on, with the exception of one, I think, were, were brought to us by our participants. Um, discussed their lives in the town, their kind of life history, if you like. Um, we brought maps along and you asked them to use sticky dots to comment on kind of mark up places that had been important throughout their lives. Um, and finally, we had a discussion of kind of everyday energy use in the town, which is the data we've actually done the least with so far. By and large, people's use of energy in Port Talbot mirrors people's use of energy elsewhere in the UK. There, none of our participants lived off the gas network. Um, there were the same kind of mixed experiences of smart meter rollout that you would expect from elsewhere in the UK. In terms of energy use, Port Talbot. Um, the citizenry of Port Talbot is not that much different from the citizenry of other places. Um, our second, the kind of second aspect of our methodology were these community workshops, um, which involved returning to the maps that we'd worked with in the interviews and getting a kind of group discussion going about important places in the town um, and the town's kind of relationship with industry and infrastructure to date. We had a drawing task where we asked people to sketch out the contemporary energy system. And again, that didn't tell us very much. We didn't know people's feelings about energy and ideas about energy were, were slightly vague. They were able to identify energy, research, uh, energy retail companies, but not very much in terms of network operators. Um, and people tended to point to the really highly identifiable stuff, the really ob visually obvious stuff. So pylons and uh, wind turbines were the kind of most common things people drew. Then we really got into the meat of our data collection, which was exploring and discussing four scenarios for kind of decarbonisation of Port Talbot, which we developed through previous conversations with, with other experts on the Flexus project, so the engineering work package essentially. And we asked people to design characters through, so through a kind of persona's task where they designed kind of an imaginary character that would inhabit and live through these, these, these scenarios to really get a feel for what life would be like for that person. And we concluded with a kind of final discussion and, and wrap up, which was all fairly standard. In terms of the scenarios we were working with, these were derived from interviews with Flexus, expert, Flexus experts, which were conducted by my colleague, Chris Groves, who identified four kind of potential trajectories um, representing different degrees of user engagement and centralization of the energy system. And these were kind of, and we framed these to our participants as very much visions rather than predictions. So the first scenario we developed was something called Grid Town, which was kind of like the negative hypothesis. What if we actually don't do very much decentralization? What if we keep user engagement to an absolute minimum as we decarbonize the energy system? Um, so here, electricity was still provided through the national grid. The national gas network was still in operation, albeit carrying hydrogen produced through steam methane reformation of natural gas. Um, all electricity was coming from low carbon sources and storage was conducted kind of out there on the grid in warehouses somewhere filled with batteries or, or something to that effect. And there was very little user interaction with the energy system beyond kind of smart metering and perhaps some incentives through kind of variable energy tariffs to, to switch off your appliances during times of peak demand, essentially. So a bit of smartification, but not much else affecting daily life. Uh, our second scenario was kind of the polar opposite of that. We called it virtual marketplace where many towns and many buildings in Port Talbot have their own solar panels and batteries. Um, they're all reliant on electric heat, air source heat pumps. Um, homes and businesses are able to trade surplus energy between themselves and their batteries. So prices become far more flexible, far more variable according to minute by minute, hour by hour, the availability of energy on the grid. 
and really in this scenario you would only be bringing in energy from outside in a kind of a worst case scenario and the expectation is it would be quite expensive to do that um, but a lot of this was done by AI in the home was how we kind of framed it uh, our third scenario was industrial hearth and in this scenario uh, Newport Talbot Council along with local industry had taken far more um, control and influence over the energy system in the town so there was a district heating system using waste heat from the steelworks um, local businesses local authority buildings every every private kind of company building every corporate entity in in the town essentially is covered in wind turbines solar panels um, and all of this is sold to consumers through a local district heat and power company um, that's selling energy as a service so you buy a contract for a set number of warm hours per month or, or power hours <clears throat> as kind of a package along with kind of insulation upgrades and upgrades radiators and things like that and our final scenario was our kind of hydrogen scenario which we called energy island and in this one port talbot is largely separate from the national electricity grid with all power in the town produced through kind of localized renewable resources and backup buffering provided by hydrogen, some of which is brought in from outside, but a lot of which is produced locally using water electrolysis. Um, and all of this is, you, it's a far more kind of localised uh, set of relationships. You do have a series of energy retail companies in the town, but they're far more, more locally based. So those are our scenarios. So to begin with, in terms of findings, um, our kind of initial mapping that we did in interviews and in interviews in the first stages of workshops identified a series of kind of concerns located in place, uh, which impacted how people thought about infrastructure as discussions moved on throughout the day. So there are a series of clusters in this diagram, which I'm just going to take you through very briefly. There was a cluster of kind of interest around the seafront, which is this area here. Most of that was to do with people's kind of favorite places, places that were important to people during childhood. But at the same time, this was seen as an area of perhaps a little bit of neglect. There was a sense that perhaps not very much investment had gone into the seafront over the years, and that perhaps a certain amount of the council's attention had been taken up with providing infrastructure to benefit steelworks, essentially. Uh, and that concern also affected the town center, which was very much seen as in serious long-term decline people pointed to the rise of charity shops um vape shops mobile phone shops and the the kind of the closure of the kind of prestigious stores that they remember remembered from their youth and it was really seen as kind of becoming an area of increased crime homelessness and not really somewhere that you would want to to visit as as either a resident or a tourist um the next cluster that people spoke about in some detail was the steelworks down here. Now, for some people, this was seen as kind of a favorite place in the town. So uh, there were one or two participants who had, had long fulfilling careers there, whose identities were very much bound up in being steelworkers, who spoke very positively about this place as a site of camaraderie and importance. And certainly most of our participants agreed that this was a really important place for the local community. At the same time, it was seen as a site of potential risk, danger. There was a large explosion at the plant during the time that we were conducting the research, which was um, both the site and the sound of the explosion could be heard as far away as Swansea. So everyone in the town was aware of it. Most of our participants had, had been woken up by it. Um, but at the same time, people didn't by and large think the steelworks was hugely unsafe. It was kind of a discussion of managed risk. Uh, this is a population that's accustomed to living alongside heavy industry and, and accustomed to the idea that accidents might happen once in a while, but by and large, uh, if everyone's obeying the rules and doing what they should be doing, uh, it should be broadly safe. So this, these kind of red dots uh, weren't necessarily people panicked, but just this site is one of the more dangerous places in Port Talbot, along with one of the junctions on the M4 up here. Um, the kind of next cluster of spaces that people really thought mattered was, it's kind of spread out, but it's this whole line along the mountains here, and people had different spots of the mountains that they like to walk in, but the discourse about these places was all the same. It was about kind of exposure to nature, uh, the kind of the sense of well-being that you get from walking in the hills, 
um, and childhood memories of walks with families, particularly around Margan Park, which is the historic country estate down here, which, which has an old ruined abbey and a little bit more in terms of tourist infrastructure than the rest of town. But again, this was seen as not perhaps being made most of by the council, it is a site that's, that's operated by the local authority. Um, and when the kind of headline findings of how people related to the town was this sense of industrial reliance, the sense that many of our participants, not just the multi-generational residents, this went across groups actually, uh, lived in Port Talbot. This house belongs to one of our participants, Marcus, and this house was built by his father in the 1950s, who had moved to the town to work in the steelworks. And that was the case for a lot of our participants. Um, and there was a strong sense that there's been a lot of uncertainty around the future of the steelworks. Uh, Tata Steel has been considering selling it. There was serious discussion of its closure uh, to do with the financial troubles linked to the pension scheme there just two years ago. And there was a sense amongst participants that if that steelworks closes, that's that's the end of that's the end of the town. Um, and there was this metaphor that kept coming up of Port Talbot will be a ghost town, and this was seen as something that that should be avoided at all costs. But at the same time, there was this discourse that alongside that, there was this discourse of environmental harm being done by the steelworks. Uh, so damage to wildlife and ecosystems, harm to local air quality, but also more generally the sense that all of this attention being on the steelworks has detracted from the town as a potential tourist location, which it had been in the past, certainly it was in the 1960s and 70s that it was kind of putting off visitors, that it was giving the area a bad reputation, um, that people from outside referred to the town as Port Toilet, and that came up quite repeatedly, and it was something that our participants were really quite upset about. They'd kind of joke about it, but the joking was kind of as a defense mechanism. Maybe it was not something that people wanted to be associated with, unsurprisingly. And at times, amongst the large minority of our participants, this really did translate into a sense of cynicism and alienation. And there was this strong discourse. The council really wasn't interested in um, the things that meant things to the local population. Um, so there was this conspiracy theory that the local council had been involved in a series of fires around the town attached to um, listed buildings and local landmark. So the local Lido, swimming baths, um, the Green Meadow, which is mentioned in this quote from Cheryl, which is an old pub and very much again a, a local landmark, and also a local hotel, which was often used for, for weddings. And there was explicit talk of corruption across several groups that councillors were taking bribes either from the steelworks or from some of the small restaurant holders along the riverfront. Um, so this is this is Franco's Cafe, which is another one of these landmarks along the seafront that people spoke about quite affectionately, but at the same time, there was well, there's nothing else there apart from Franco's and the ice cream shop further down the beach, which is also owned by Franco. There's nothing there, and there there was this theory that that Franco and his Italian family were were controlling the city, <clears throat> the the seafront by paying off councillors essentially and preventing um, other businesses, tourist enterprises from from building up there and really making the most of it and then attracting more visitors in. <clears throat> so, despite all this, people were quite positive about daily life in Port Talbot, um, despite the kind of reputational worries, and people were quite keen to point to the aspects of the local landscape that they thought was attractive, were keen to say, well, look, I, I've lived here all my life, I wouldn't want to move, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Um, and there was this sense that places like the park, like the beach, like the mountains, were, were kind of restorative environments. There were places that people would go to get away from everyday life. Um, there were places that people relied on, um, not just for exercise, but for kind of emotional sustenance, if you like. <clears throat> and these places were really seen as kind of the potential future of the town, um, whereas the steelworks were seen as kind of shrouded in uncertainty as being very much fickle and might potentially go within the next 30 years. And people were very much aware, of, they were very aware that, that this was a distinct possibility. Uh, these kind of outdoor locations were the places that people were really pinning their hopes on and this is what we could do something with if if, if industry leaves us yeah 
um, and that that might have benefits in terms of quality of life, albeit it would come with some economic harms. And this wasn't by any means all of our participants, but it was a strong, about 50% of the participants kind of fell into this category of, of kind of rejecting industry really and, and being quite keen to think about alternative routing in, in tourism and, and kind of outdoor pursuits, if you like. And this spilled over into our discussion of scenarios um, in quite significant ways. So when it came to our discussions of industrial heart, this was the scenario with a district heating network uh, centered on the steelworks. Um, the uncertainty to, to do with the steelworks was really seen as just writing the scenario off. It was just seen as too uncertain how we, there was a sense that the town had so many economic eggs in the basket of heavy industry that did they really want their, their heating system to be reliant on it as well. Um, so it was seen as really quite risky and not something any of our participants, even the most committed of steel workers who really strongly identified with, with that aspect of the town, did not want to see the town become further reliant on that as a kind of a, a source of energy. That was seen as just, just too much, it was a step too far for them. Um, and for our more cynical participants like, like Jennifer here, it was just seen as opening up more possibilities for, for corruption. And that also applied to um, Energy Island as well, to a lesser extent, where it was kind of local businesses, again, providing aspects of energy infrastructure, that kind of form of localised infrastructure governance. Given the reputation of the council and the, the belief locally, and I'm not saying this belief is correct, I, we have, I have no data to suggest it is correct. Uh, but this belief was really seen as, as unacceptable. People just couldn't fathom the idea that you would trust the council with, with anything um, more lucrative than, than, than what they're already told, essentially. It was seen as being very much kind of open to abuse. Uh, when it came to our virtual marketplace scenario, this is the one with kind of peer-to-peer -peer energy trading and, and kind of highly decentralized to the household level in terms of your generation and storage, electricity generation and storage infrastructure. Um, and households taking on a far greater role in balancing energy supply and demand. Most of the concerns we had were to do with um, aspects of fairness. <clears throat> so there was this idea that a lot of people would struggle with, struggle either to buy um, smart appliances, smart controls, they might struggle to afford heat pumps, they might struggle to afford batteries, and that in an energy system where having this equipment potentially could get you cheaper energy bills by reducing your peak time energy demands, this was really seen as opening up all sorts of new forms of, of vulnerability. And for some participants like Claire, who's quoted here, it's a fairly abstract concern. Claire is fairly well paid well-played um, member of staff working in the offices at Tata Steel. Her family don't struggle with their bills. For her, this is a kind of an abstract, what about these other people that might struggle? For Crystal, on the other hand, who was a, a single mum working as a cleaner in the steelworks on a, on a very low income, um, this was a real concern in the present. She already struggled with her bills. And the idea that uh, energy tariffs might vary minute to minute, hour to hour, was just seen as it's just unmanageable to her. She just couldn't fathom how she would how she would cope with that, let alone invest in perhaps a battery or something that, or a, or a heat pump that might help reduce the energy costs. <clears throat> At the same time, amongst our more cynical participants, such as Heather, who's quoted here, um, she saw potential for this kind of network system to be abused. She saw it as a potential for kind of unemployed residents or people who are on drugs, the kind of more disreputable neighbours who had moved in to support Talbot's fortunes had declined. She saw this as an opportunity that they might seize to, to not contribute, to not um, be careful with the amount of energy they use, to not adjust their demand. She saw this as potentially a way of, of those less reputable neighbours kind of leeching off of her and, and more kind of hardworking people in the town. So there were these two kind of concerns about fairness that kind of rubbed alongside each other quite uneasily, this concern for vulnerability and this concern that the system would be open to abuse. <clears throat> um, what these two kind of currents led to amongst some participants was this sense that a more centralised approach might be the more feasible option. Um, it would reduce the need to rely on 
disreputable people, either disreputable neighbours who might not be contributing to local generation, might be using energy irresponsibly, or to not be reliant on on this kind of corrupt body, the council, that, that was very much an object of um, distrust. Um, at the same time, when people spoke about Gridtown as being a kind of a favoured scenario, there wasn't very much enthusiasm for it. It was very much this kind of defensive preference, if you like. And there was a sense that if you could work out some of the problems um, around the involvement of the council, either in virtual marketplace, um, if you could work out the issues with vulnerability in virtual marketplace, if you could reduce the influence of the council over Energy Island, that these might actually be more desirable and might be improvements on what we have at the moment. Um, they were seen as kind of cleaner, greener, potentially, potentially kind of more localized and more empowering community. So there was a sense emerging, particularly in discussions of Energy Island, the hydrogen scenario, but also virtual marketplace, if you could fund these things through things like credit unions, if you could have things like cooperatives uh, providing um, hydrogen in the town, so kind of a cooperatively owned uh, local energy company uh, that excluded the council, absolutely, that was a, a bottom line. Um, but looking at some of these kind of older institutions like co-ops, like uh, credit unions that have a long history in South Wales tied to industrialization um, that was seen as kind of almost uh, institutions of, of working class people for kind of solidaristic protection, if you like. That's what people were kind of alluding to when they spoke about these things. So this could actually be quite empowering for the community. Um, it would be a chance for uh, people for public to run themselves rather than being run by um, larger corporate entities um, in their own image, in their, uh, in their own interests. And, and this would seem as really quite attractive by a, a lot of participants. Um, at the same time, and this was something that didn't really intersect with our, <clears throat> this was something that I think we could have done more work on had we had more time to redevelop our scenarios. There was a sense that two of the scenarios, in particular Energy Island and Virtual Marketplace, the, the two kind of most decentralized scenarios, were seen as more in tune with nature. So discussion of this was quite abstract. People thought about it being healthier, cleaner, nicer, not an eyesore. Um, <clears throat> people saw it as potentially uh, bringing kind of new ideas to the town and that might kind of spur greater development of the town centre. But if Port Talbot could be seen as leading in these things, that might bring other things to the town that would be more in tune with kind of people's desires for tourism desires for um, kind of town centre regeneration. And this was something that I think there's quite a lot of potential for. Uh, often social acceptability work talks about the problems, yeah, it's quite negative in terms of, well, you can't do this because people see it as unfair, or you can't do that because it's seen as assault on the landscape. But actually, I think somewhere between um, energy system decarbonisation and local desires for tourism and uh, redevelopment of the high street, you can see ways that you could design those two things as fitting together um, and present it in, in quite an attractive way, which was not what we set out to do with our scenarios. Um, and it wasn't necessarily what our engineers had in mind when discussing the way the, system, the energy system might change in the future. But I think if you could marry those th two things together, uh, you would have the start of something that could be quite be quite powerful in attracting kind of local support and local buy-in. So for a quick conclusion, um, experience of industrial decline profoundly shaped the way people felt about life in Port Talbot in the present, but also the way they felt about energy systems and infrastructure change in the future. Um, and this idea of an industrial future as being seen as insecure, I think is potentially quite problematic if we're going to be framing uh, new energy system developments as being allied to heavy industry or as, as supporting Tata Steel in some way. I think that is, that's a recipe for causing local anxiety, I think. Um, meanings and emotional attachments to aspects of Port Talbot weren't simply protected. People were concerned that you might build, I don't know, a hydrogen storage tank or a carbon capture plant 
slap bang in the middle of the seafront and that certainly is or, or slap bang in the middle of the mountains where it can be seen by everyone and, and interfere with these kind of places that people really value but at the same time people were quite keen to discuss where you could put them as well it, it wasn't a case of no we don't want any of this stuff it wasn't not in my backyard it was you can put it in some places we've got quite a lot of industrial parts of the town already and put it in there and absolutely fine um, people weren't just protective, um, but at the same time, the way that some locations like the beach and the mountains were seen as a kind of a locus or a focal point for alternative futures, these are areas that you really sh that, that we would really caution against um, UN infrastructure stepping into. Um, you could expect local controversy and conflict were you to start trying to do things like that. Um, and, and finally, I can, the kind of headline, that if you take nothing else from this talk, uh, would be uh, if place-based place decarbonisation is to be successful in, in the eyes of local residents, it needs to speak to some of these alternative desires for, for a different and a better future. It can't just be um, more industry uh, to the exclusion of all else. That, that wasn't what our participants wanted. Um, so that is me done now, I think, but I'm happy to take any questions. I just want to do a quick shout out to my colleagues, Catherine Cherry, Chris Groves, Fiona Shirani, uh, Erin Roberts, Karen Henwood, and Nick Pigeon, who were all involved in the conceptualization and data collection analysis for this project. So this is a, a, a collective effort. This isn't just me. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to turn over questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. Do you want to stop sharing the screen and we can go to a sort of gallery view so we can maybe see uh, people asking questions or if they want to uh, put them in the chat. There we go. I found the button. There we go. Great. Let's see if I can chat. I don't know whether everybody is in gallery view now. Um, there's one question in the chat already. A uh, question for Gareth. What makes you confident that you found the opinions or views of the silent or apathetic majority and not just the vocal few? That's from uh, Simon uh, at Old Craig Hall in Edinburgh. I should have mentioned this. Um, we, the reason that we can be fairly confident about that is that we paid all of our participants to participate. So every participant was paid £30 for taking part in an hour and a half interview and I think it was £90 for the one day workshop. Uh, which is by no means perfect, but it is the best way of recruiting people who don't have an axe to grind, because you're right, if you just make this open to anyone and don't have any kind of uh, pur purposeful approach to recruitment, you will just get kind of a vocal minority. Um, we were quite keen to avoid that. So that that would be my answer. It's, it's by no means perfect, but it's the best way we as social scientists have come up with so far to not get your kind of your usual suspects so your local Greenpeace group or Friends of the Earth group or Netports Harbour. So <laughs> Defend Our Raven Beach is the name of the local group that's quite anti various council and when we did have members of that group um, recruited but but it, we weren't overwhelmed by them if you see what I mean. Anyone else got a question? Um, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yes. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, it's really about, I think, replacement industry. Um, having been kind of brought, been brought up in Sheffield and left there in the 80s simply because work had disappeared. Um, Port Talbot is a heavily industrialized town. Um, what, what are the feelings there about taking away heavy industry and replacing it with light industry? Um, there are quite a few, but I think areas around Durham where coal mining went, they tried to introduce, um, I think, electronics industry, this kind of stuff. And it didn't really go down well. It wasn't seen as proper work. And I think you actually mentioned that earlier. And certainly in Sheffield, I think now they're doing quite well. But we're 40 years on and 40 years is one hell of a long time you know you, you, you're coming up for two generations of people um did you examine that, that that area as well the proper work thing there was certainly um quite a strong discourse around kind of proper port talbot people yeah who were broadly speaking conceptualized as 
male over 40, work in the steelworks, and afterwards goes to the pub and watches rugby. Yeah. And is and the wife manages the electricity bills and he doesn't want to think about it at all. And that was the kind of the vision for proper Port Talbot people. At the same time, there was a recognition that actually this is something that's very much, this is a pattern of life that's very much on the way out. People spoke about that kind of job for life in the steelworks isn't really something that exists anymore. Most of the young people that go and work in there, work as contractors on kind of very insecure contracts. Um, and that while, while it's really important, the steelworks is really important as a kind of an anchor for other local industries and supporting the local service sector. Um, it was seen as kind of a thing of the past and people were quite sad about that, but they were kind of resigned to it as well. Mainly it was, it, the kind of overriding thing was this fear of people who looked at places like Merthyr Tidfil at Everdale um, and had seen what had happened there when, when the coal industry went um, and where, where other, in other parts of parts, South Wales, where, where heavy industry is, is now gone and kind of see desolation and they're concerned that that could be the future. Yeah, okay. They didn't really see a likelihood of much else coming to take its place. Um, which I think was where this kind of focusing in on tourism came from. That was seen as the kind of the economic hope for the future, if you like. Yeah. I, I, again, I must admit, um, my own background, again, is metallurgy initially, um, engineering, I suppose, latterly. Um, but again, when you've worked on places that employed 5,000 people and then ceased to exist pretty much overnight, you know, I, that is a fear I can absolutely empathise with having kind of been through it with my own family I mean you know we I myself and my dad were out of work where they shut the works down and that was it for a while you know but um, we got through it but it's not been an easy thing and as you say the, the overall fear and a lot of labouring type jobs have been replaced with higher tech jobs which disenfranchises quite a lot of people particularly the older guys and that, that also is, is a worry um, younger people, I don't think, see it that way, but, but certainly the older guys do. Retraining is not an easy job to do when you're in your 50s, for example. Um, so, yeah, I can empathise with that, that attitude quite a bit. No, and, and that retrain that's an important point, actually, which I kind of skimmed over when I was discussing people's kind of desires for a more localised energy system, was that it was very much conditional in part on there needs to be training in place. Um, if we're going to be having this stuff locally in Port Talbot, is going to be kind of leading the way in decarbonisation. Um, these need to be local jobs. Yeah. Um, but particularly, for the, the discourse actually tended to be more on younger people um, who had kind of been locked out of the steelworks um, as, as it's kind of increasingly shed, shed its labour force. Um, kind of opportunities for younger people who otherwise have to move away if they want well paid work essentially. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? I wondered if um, if I can ask a question. Internationally, are there examples of other countries using this sort of approach, you know, more proactively? You know, are the Swedes particularly good at using this when citing wind turbines or do the Americans use this for motorway projects? Are there examples of, of other nations around the world taking a more, uh, taking more time to consult and understand how populations feel? Or is this um, new entirely? The, 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 uh, the Netherlands is kind of the, the golden child for this kind of work who have a very highly institutionalized um, approach to consulting publics um, and have kind of things like citizens juries that that really have a set, that are kind of employed full time almost. They're, they're constantly running them um, in relation both to their innovation policy, but also in terms of kind of their, their kind of long-term infrastructure planning. Um, so it's, it's very heavily institutionalized over there. Uh, what we've tried to do with this project, which is slightly different, is localised it. So talking not just about kind of what would this do for the country, is this a desirable direction for the country, but is this a 
a desirable direction for, for this town, um, which has never been done before, I think, at a kind of whole system scale. It's been done in individual projects linked to things like wind turbine development uh, all over the place. And it has quite a good track record of reducing tensions with local community and improving uh, citizens' satisfaction with with the outcomes, regardless of whether. Uh, and there's some evidence to suggest that it can help in situations, even when citizens' groups don't get their own way if there's been this kind of, if they see the process as being fair in themselves as having been listened to, um, that can sometimes improve satisfaction of the outcomes. Maybe an unfair sort of follow-up question then. So is it possible to guess how, what percentage of the population would have to take part in a process like this before it had an impact on, you know, on the on the community's perception. You know, are we talking five percent, one percent, ten percent? It's quite unfair. difficult to judge. I mean, and and partly because it's not been done on a huge scale. But if you look at the citizens jury that was convened in Northern Ireland around the issue of it's Northern Ireland or the Republic in Ireland uh, to do over the issue of abortion, where I think it was a hundred members of the public that were given several months, loads of expert input, loads of time to deliberate on what to do in a very historically Catholic country on a really contentious social issue. But the citizen panel made its rec recommendations, they were accepted by the government, it led to a change in legislation and it did kind of bypass some of the high stakes controversy that I think you would see if that was a decision being taken by politicians. Um, I think it's a similar approach that's being uh, approached, uh, being tried with things like the climate assemblies in in the UK. Uh, there is a sense that if you can show that these are ordinary people taking part, uh, forming decisions, yes, with expert input, but allowed to ask questions and make their own decisions. There is some evidence to suggest that this could be a way of sidestepping some of the controversies when it's seen as being politicians or parties with a financial interest making those decisions. And what I think both of those and what our history of working with kind of deliberative type methodologies I think shows is that members of the public are more than capable of getting their heads around quite complex issues and debating them with, with a certain degree of sophistication. It takes quite there's a serious thought process that goes into thinking through something like peer-to-peer -peer energy trading and what the impacts on vulnerable groups might be. And we didn't really provide any leadership on that. That was something our participants came up with on their own. Okay, People thanks. can do this. I, I'm quite, I'm something of an evangelist for this particular approach of, of dealing with some of these controversies because I think it does present a way of taking some of the heat out of them. Any other questions? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, no, this is a really great project and I can see that there is a, yeah, it's a very complex issue and uh, you said at the beginning that there are other branches, right? And uh, I guess it would be interesting, I don't know, like to apply the same methodology about perceptions in education, for instance, or, uh, people, I don't know, like pensioners, uh, people coming out of the steel works and um, I don't know, uh, mental health, for instance, is there any other, um, I don't know, branches there, topics that this project uh, I don't know, like in research. So uh, is that any other fields this kind of methodology has been used in or is this other branches that the kind of the engineering package reflects? Yeah, like no, if, if the project also, I don't know, like uh, there is some more research going on, other perceptions about other issues that the, can, the community might have, like education, for instance. Yeah, because it's a really good methodology to, I don't know, like to get the feeling uh, about other issues in society, right? Different. Uh, there have been different versions of it developed in lots of different fields. So in addition to the kind of citizens assembly, uh, citizen jury type things, um, there has been quite a lot of work on participatory budgeting, uh, particularly among local authorities, where local citizens come in and, and kind of look at the town budget and decide how money should be 
should be spent. And again, there was a kind of a concern when this stuff first started appearing that it could be quite messy, that people were not invested in popular things, but actually it has quite a good track record of, of improving um, people's faith in kind of local budgeting processes. Um, it's been used in relation to medical ethics. So things like uh, the use of stem cells, uh, the use of uh, gene editing techniques, things like that. Um, there's quite a lot of discussion of using it around nanomaterials as well, um, moving back into a more kind of technology type space. Um, it's also been used around geoengineering. I know a couple of cases there. Does that answer your question, sorry? Yeah, yeah, no, I was reflecting on, on some articles I read and in about San Francisco, how the Silicon Valley has well, pretty much taking over all that area. And these companies, Google, Facebook, um, Apple, they just have their headquarters there. Uh, how that has affected actually life in San Francisco, for instance, or how the community might not really be in favor of those companies being too powerful or being too, I don't know, like not paying enough taxes to support other issues that there are in their communities, right? For instance, and uh, if we come here to the Midlands, um, well, now with Rolls Royce and Derby having some restructuring after all this, you know, like emergency with the COVID, yeah, uh, there is lots of uh, potential actually, yeah, like to extrapolate this research into some of these cases, right? I think so. I think, I mean, I think the real strength of the methodology we've developed here in particular is that you can go into that kind of very local detail, which things like the, the kind of Dutch approach to technology appraisal mm -hmm. kind of misses that local, local dimension. And I, I think there is quite a lot of potential there for thinking about the impacts of a whole series of different decisions at that kind of more, more decentralized level. Yeah, no, you can really see how, for instance, I don't know, decisions like, yeah, this restructuring of Rolls-Royce really affects Derby and really, you know, like has an echo in the Midlands, not only Derby, actually, yeah, like even Birmingham or uh, Lancashire, um, Glasgow also, I mean, yeah, there is Inchin and there, uh, there is, yeah, like a big um, debate about, you know, like continuous work to restructure in that way or the other, because, yeah, um, it's a big community. And then you'd really see, yeah, like people coming together. I mean, yeah, if there's some redundancies, you can really see people caring and people, yeah, helping each other, or at least, you know, like um, giving some advice on mental health, for instance. So there's, it's good potential actually to, to know, I mean, yeah, what people feels because yeah, at the end, yeah, um, some of these big companies are big, still works for instance for Talbot, yeah, like um, definitely, yeah, like influence, you know, life around. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, Tata still Maybe does I have, have its, really... sorry. I mean, Tata still does have its own kind of community panel, but they're very much focused on, the present day and kind of individual decisions about, well, what if we change the road layout in this part of town to allow better access to this part of the world? And it's quite, or what, what if we invest part of our community fund in this particular, I don't know, kids activity center or whatever. It's, it's not looking at that kind of broad long-term impact on, on the town. So yeah, th thank you. We're, we're quite optimistic about it anyway. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I'm going to try to read some papers and yeah, like get up to speed. Yeah, with this great research. So it's nearly eight o'clock. I think if there's no one else got a burning question, I think I'll say a few words of thanks and we can bring the evening to a close. So Dr. Thompson's talk. talk. Is... Ah, sorry, Dr. Jim. Thomas. Did you have a Paul. Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Thomas's talk this evening was called It's Not a Very Certain Future. I doubt we've ever had a more topical talk <laughs> every evening for three months, six months, several years. We must all sit staring open mouthed at our TV news programs and wonder how people can possibly believe the things they do. So this evening, our speaker has addressed not just an engineering question, but a fundamental question of human existence. And he's done it in the context of, of energy. I think it's particularly relevant to large scale engineering problems. We all know that uh, as young engineers, we perceive the world as, as one that needed to be calculated and that uh, you know, a hard problem involved a lot of mathematics. And as the years have gone by, We've discovered that the easy problems are the ones that you can calculate and all the hard problems involve people and communication. So this evening's topic isn't just an abstract 
observation of something nice to do, but increasingly it's an essential part of engineering where all projects have to get permission in some way from the communities whose perception of facts and information are so different from, let's say, us engineers. This evening we've seen how discussion of alternative scenarios can be used to engage stakeholders and tease out an understanding of what people feel as well as know. So it's fascinating insight and time and time again when you were speaking I wondered why this approach is still unusual. You know why is social intelligence and the understanding of public perception of risk so seldom considered in fully in large engineering projects. So you've given us lots of food for thought. Um, I, I think many of us will go away and uh, do some Googling around what you've been speaking, what you've been, the topics you've, you've introduced us to. So let's uh, thank our speaker in the traditional way. <laughs> well, very easy online. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. For, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Jonathan, just before we go, can I do a, a, a hapless plug for our uh, online presence, if that's all right, to the to the group? Oh so obviously, I don't know if everybody knows, but we've started to run a sort of YouTube channel for this stuff. Um, so that's up and running at the moment. And there's also an Instagram page. So for the YouTube, uh, if you just search for IMA Key, Edinburgh and South East Scotland area, um, all the videos go up on there. I'll hopefully get this one up tomorrow. Um, so you can go back and have a look at them and leave comments and stuff. Um, and we've also got an Instagram page, which is imeki underscore E-S-E-S-A. So we're trying to kind of increase our online social media presence. So um, if anybody's interested or wants to be involved, um, just have a look at that stuff below 